Good afternoon. So I thought today we'd talk a little bit about scalability, seeing as we're at dot .scale. And scalability is a particularly interesting term to me because it can mean so many different things. It can mean scaling in terms of amount of data, number of nodes, number of people at an organization. And one of the interesting things about scalability in the last couple of years is the evolution of microservices. I imagine many of you are using a lot of microservices internally to develop applications. Maybe you've got one, maybe you've got 100, maybe you've got too many. And I imagine many of you have a lot of third-party services also, whether it's Salesforce or Eloqua or Twilio, various services that you use to help your team build applications faster, to get things out the door quicker. And it's a, it's a model that I think is you know, taking off now and is only going to get bigger and bigger. So if you take a look at something that I think about a lot, which is the services that MongoDB itself uses as a company, not as a database, there's uh, quite a few. So we've got a, a bunch, we've got a cloud service, which actually is composed of many microservices. We've got Salesforce and Twilio and Eloqua and Google Analytics and SurveyMonkey and a whole bunch of things. So there's a few problems that arise from this model. So one is, how do you keep data consistent? How do you sort of have a transaction across all of these services? So that's a really interesting topic that we're not going to talk at all about today. The next topic is, how do I look at the data? So each one of these services has a pretty good way to look at its own data. If you want to go to Salesforce, Salesforce has got a great reporting system. You can use it. You can get a lot of great reports out of it. Jira's got great reporting. SurveyMonkey's got OK reporting. But if you want to actually look at everything together, that's sort of a, a pretty big challenge. So if you want to sort of get a view of a MongoDB user, let's take a look at what that actually means from a system standpoint. So first, maybe what we want to know what pages in the documentation you viewed. Well, that is mostly through Google Analytics, because we track what people view on our website. Let's say you want to look at what online courses you're looking at for MongoDB through MongoDB University. That is, a, that is on the MongoDB University system, which again is composed of a few different microservices. As you can see, this is starting to add up quite quickly. We've got things from the community, like whether you're using different things in university. We've got Jira saying things like whether you are filing bug requests, filing features, whether you want things, which determine a lot about how active you are as a user. We have things whether you are downloading the product a lot, whether you downloaded it once or maybe you got rid of it, maybe you didn't use it very much. Whether you're using our cloud services, how much you're using it, how many servers you have, what versions you're on. If you're a client, we send out a lot of surveys trying to see if you're happy, if you're not happy, if you are very happy, what you don't like, what you don't like, and that data is largely stored in SurveyMonkey. We've got from Salesforce, whether you're paying us, whether you're a client, whether you're, you know, again, what you're sort of doing with MongoDB. We've got feature requests that come out of Jira once again, and we've got mailing lists and other sort of marketing data from Eloqua. So this is just sort of a pretty typical, and I don't think MongoDB is particularly unique in any of these cases. Right, it's got a whole bunch of systems and services. The last time we counted the number of third-party services that had some amount of data relating to our customers, it was 130, which is a lot, but I don't think it's actually that surprising to many of you, because I think it's pretty common these days. So data is spread all over the map. So the question is, now I want to understand my data. I want to ask some questions. And how, how do I go about doing that? Where do I get the data? How do I even start? So if you go back in time, maybe, I'm not sure how long, 10, 20, more than 10 years, 20 years ago, how do you solve this problem? Well, you write some reports. You write a program. The program is going to go and get data from different sources and do some programming on it, and you're going to get a report. And this works pretty well because you're hiring developers who are pretty smart, and they can pretty much solve any problem you ask them to. It just may take time or money. So maybe you hire some consultants, and this all works pretty well if you have a lot of time because the time to actually get these reports takes a long time, and if you're on the consultant routes, it just takes a lot of money. So you can always hire consultants, they'll pay them, they'll, you pay them a lot of money, and they'll generate your reports for you. And that works pretty well. The problem is, one, it's very expensive, and two, the time to get a report that you want is very high, and three, there's no ability to sort of play with the data, right? Because sometimes you don't know what questions you want to ask up front. You know you have a lot of data, you know you want to sort of do things better, but you don't know exactly what that means in the context of, of your questions. So you want to sort of have a tool to be able to go look at the data, Maybe a tool like Tableau or Click that lets you explore the data and try to find correlations and find interesting things. That all works well. So the way you, that doesn't really work with sort of all these different systems. So people started building data warehouses. And data warehouses are great because you sort of take all your data and you put it in a warehouse. And what you do is you structure the data up front so you have a nice schema for it, sort of model the whole business. And it may take you a while to do that, but you can get it all in there eventually. And um, maybe. 
And you can use all these tools. And when you use these tools, it's great because you can sort of do this ad hoc reporting. You can do sort of make the business users come close to the data so they can sort of make progress. So that all works pretty well. So you get all your data and you ship it all over. And the problem with data warehouses that I've seen the most is you've got new data types coming, new data types all the time, new schemas, all these different things happening. And what ends up happening is you've got all these trucks coming to your data warehouse trying to get in the door. And it doesn't work very well. So you want to go much faster. You want to be able to get data in faster, and you want to be able to still have all those same features. So the next iteration in this model, as far as I can tell, is data lakes. And data lakes are great, because you have the same amount of data coming in, and you take all the data and you put it into the lake, and it looks all really nice at the end. Except the reality is that most data lakes end up sort of these big, messy things that are both expensive to maintain, because they've got way too much stuff in them, hard to understand, because you've got different schemas, different versions, different kinds of things. Things are changing all the time. And you can't really make a whole lot of sense of this. Luckily for us, our friends at IBM have tried to solve the problem. So IBM came up with a very simple system that looks like this. <laughs> um, so what they tried to do with this was combine the best features of data warehouses with data lakes. If you're like me, I put those two things together, and I, th I think it looks like this. Warehouses and lakes don't seem to go well together in my mind. I mean, this slide is just way too complicated. So what I want to do is uh, start fresh. So let's go back to the very beginning. We had some really good features from custom reports that we liked. We had some really good features from all these different features, so we can think about those things. And there's one premise that I think we should sort of talk about for a second, which is lakes, warehouses, whatever the sort of the new term is, they all assume that you have to put all the data in one place. And I don't necessarily think that's true. So let's first think about what we want, you know, we want to build a new system. So let's design, let's put some goals on paper and sort of talk about those. So here we have the best features from each one of the systems that we talked about. So custom reports are great because you have flexibility, right? You can sort of, you know, if you give developers tools, they can pretty much solve any problem. You can do all sorts of optimization because again, if you give a developer tools and access to things, they can sort of do whatever they want. Data warehouses are great because you can have sort of this really fast ad hoc exploration of data. You can use tools like Tableau, you can use tools like Click, and you can sort of do really great things like that. And data lakes have, are great because you can get sort of low friction ingestion. You can sort of put data in quickly. If there's new data types, new, as the schema changes, you sort of keep putting data in. And so that all works pretty well. So the next thing we need is a, a problem. So let's, take, let's look at a very specific problem. So let's go back to sort of the MongoDB use case. So we want to answer a little bit of a made up question, but let's, let's run with it. So we want to separate our customers into two different groups. Those that have viewed our production notes page in our documentation and those that haven't. And see if one group has a higher net promoter score than the other. Right, so basically see if the customers who actually bothered to read the production notes had a better experience using MongoDB and therefore were happier in the end than the ones who didn't. Okay, to do that, we need to both merge things like the documentation statistics, who viewed what pages, actually who the users are. We need to go figure out what users are associated with, dip, with, dip, with which clients. We need to look at the actual survey data to see if the clients are happy or not. We need to see you know, where, they, where they come from so we can sort of understand why. So this is sort of the basic question we have. So let's start with one, let's start with one approach. We'll go through two approaches. The first one's kind of fun. So let's assume for a second that you are using a third-party service and there's one interesting way you could think about this, is let's say you're using Salesforce. Salesforce keeps all of your data on their servers. So let's assume for a minute that they didn't. Let's assume that they kept all your data on your servers. So what if you actually had a model where everyone wrote to your database? So this is kind of interesting, right? Because now you've got all your data in your data center or your, in your cloud account. It's kind of interesting. So you sign up for Salesforce, you give them a database URL. You sign up for Eloqua, you give them a database URL. So this is pretty interesting, because now you've got all the data in your database, and you can sort of do, it, do things with it. Some challenges. One, it means everyone has to use the same kind of database, or you're stuck managing all kinds of databases. Um, and another big problem is sort of when things go wrong, as they will, whose fault is it? Something's slow. And you're going to end up in this sort of weird situation where, you know, it's your database is slow, you no, know, the query's terrible, it's the network, and the network guy's going to end up getting screwed at the end, because the network guy always gets screwed at the end. This is the way the story always goes. So that, that might not work. Well, the network guy's in here, I'm sorry. I always end up blaming you. 
So let's try something else. So you want to keep the data where it is, because it's pretty happy where it is. Why make lots of copies of it? So let's just say you could actually write a system that went out and generated, that queried all these different systems and got the data it needed. So there's some challenges, but let's just, let's just walk through an example of what this might look like. So I'm gonna do this using MongoDB. You don't have to. This is just a prototype that we're sort of building internally and it's pretty cool, but you can sort of apply this to anything in theory. So um, let's start with this. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna create a view. Views in MongoDB are a new feature that's coming out, but you can sort of imagine what they, they're kind of like a view in any, any other database. And you can make a view of an aggregation pipeline. So let's imagine we had an aggregation stage that was get Salesforce client list. And just uh, to give you, a, for those who don't know MongoDB well, the aggregation pipeline is basically a composable compute pipeline. So things, think Unix pipelines, but instead of having text files flowing through the pipeline, you have you know, streams of documents. And the nice thing is that the query optimizer inside of MongoDB can go ahead and re reorganize things, move things around, and parallelize things and sort of do all sorts of fancy things. But from a developer standpoint, you just think of it as a pipeline of data flowing through it, and you can sort of compose it very, very cleanly. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna get our, our client list. So we're gonna take this client list, and for each one of those clients, we're gonna put it through three different stages. And these three stages are all about getting the, the users associated with that client exposed. So we're gonna get our user list from Jira, we're gonna get a user list from our cloud services through, our, through a, rem a remote Mongo query, and we're gonna get a user list from Salesforce. We're gonna take all those user lists and sort of now we've got all of those in our document for each one of our clients. Then we're going to unwind those, so Mongo things. So basically we had arrays of users before, now we wanna expand those, so we actually have one document per user. Then we're gonna to go to Google, Google Analytics and decide whether, you know, and figure out what pages each one of those users have viewed. So now we've got a user document, a one document per user with a list of pages they viewed, let's call it in the last like 90 days or whatever, whatever else we can figure. Then we're, for each one of those users, we're gonna decide whether or not they viewed the, document, the pages we care about, the production notes page. And then we're gonna group them. We're gonna group them by whether or not they viewed the production notes page. And we're going to call average NPS as the, you know, the NPS of each one of those things. And I'm you know, skipping over the NPS math a little bit, but you sort of get the basic idea. We can actually use this to pretty nicely go out and fetch the data we want from all these different third party services or our own internal microservices. And at the end of the day, ask really interesting questions. So there's some pretty sort of obvious challenges here. I'm sure you're all thinking of them. Well, now we're going over the network. So every time you do a query, I'm, uh, you know, if I've got 1,000 clients, this could very easily turn into, you know, I don't know, 100,000 network calls. That could take, you know, forever. So how do you sort of solve that problem? That's one problem. So, the other, uh, so one way you can look at that problem is with a query optimizer. So one of the cool things about doing this inside of a database is the database can learn what the data looks like, can understand what the data looks like, and can actually let you do things like it can reorder things, it can do batching. So instead of doing 100,000 network calls, it can go out and do only 1,000 network calls because it knows that it has to batch. It all depends on how you sort of specify the semantics of each one of these stages. The other, the other way you can sort of solve this problem is with caching. Now caching is interesting for a couple of reasons. One, it avoids a network call. So if you can cache certain data locally, you can you know, not have to go over the network. And caching is also interesting because it puts a lot of control in the developer's hands or in the person who, using the tool's hands. Because you can just say in one of these stages, you know what, I'm okay with the data being returned for this stage if it's less than 24 hours old or less than a week old. Or you know what, you can even go further and say, I want to actually take the data from this query and save it so that I can rerun this report later and maybe, or a slightly different report. So save all the data I need to do this operation in a, in a you know, a cache called you know, February. And then so later I can say do the same query but get the data from the February cache. So I can actually do snapshotting. Because one of the challenges of third party services like Salesforce is they don't actually have a historical record. So you end up not wanting just to have an API for, sale, an API for Salesforce, you wanna have a timed API for Salesforce so you can actually ask questions like what was the value for this field three months ago? So with this maybe you can get around that too. Other things you might sort of have a, a challenge with is, is this gonna have an impact on my production system, right? I'm now doing all these queries on my production system. So you have to have a way 
of specifying certain nodes that can handle these, this kind of traffic and certain nodes that are not allowed to handle this kind of traffic. In MongoDB, that would be sort of a tag replication where you can dedicate some nodes as my analytics nodes and queries of this type can only hit those nodes. So that's a configuration option. So now you've got a lot of configuration options. But the beauty of this is that it's all sort of controlled at the query layer. Right? It's not an incredibly complicated ingestion thing. It's not offline. It's all very real time. Developers can go and add these as often as they want or as quickly as they want. So you're putting control back into the developer's hands. And with views, you can sort of create cached views of these things. So you really have given the developers a lot of control about the way the system works, how to optimize it, and how to make that all work really nicely. So we're kind of close. We're getting there. This might work. So how do we, you know, if, we, if people like this idea, how do we make this a reality? How do we sort of turn this into from a, a theory into something that makes any sense? So we've got a to-do list. So one, I think documents are really important. And documents are really important because you've got data coming from all these different sources that doesn't necessarily fit into very clean models. And also, the APIs for all of these services tend to be sort of document-based. Right? You, your Salesforce API does not expose a relational interface. It exposes a document interface. You get a document about a client, and you want to be able to store it as a document. So we've got, we've got that. We need sort of a debuggable and composable compute pipe. Right? Aggregation is nice because you can think of it as a developer standpoint as data flowing, and you just think of it very cleanly. But then you can go optimize it on the back end, so that's really nice. So now we've got things we don't have. So we need a specification for how to write stages. How do we let developers write these stages in languages of their choice, perhaps, or maybe in a couple, that expose enough information to the query optimizer, to the caching layer, so that we can actually do interesting things, so that we can actually make the performance OK, so that we can make the caching really sensible. We need to figure out a query optimizer that actually can work with these kinds of things. How do we do the right batching? How do we reorder? How do we you know, handle those things? We need to figure out the exact semantics for caching. What are the kind of semantics that people want for this kind of thing? What are all the kinds of queries you want to write, and how would that work? And all this really means standards. So I actually think this is a pretty interesting idea, not in small part because you know, at MongoDB ourselves, we have this problem quite, uh, quite seriously from a system, corporate system standpoint. So we're actually building a proof of concept of this now to see if we can sort of solve our questions before we go off and build a data warehouse that won't work. So we're actually incredibly interested in it for ourselves, and I'm particularly interested in it for ourselves. So we're actually starting to build it now. And what I'd really like to ask, to ask everyone here to do is sort of, if you're interested, reach out to us, ask me questions, so we can actually maybe develop some standards around this and see if we can't make this all work really nicely together. Thanks.